Today we are beyond blessed to have a servant of the living God, servant of the Lord, a woman who's been faithful to our Lord through her journey. There's a lot of ups and downs, but God still hold her in the palms of his hand. She's gonna be sharing her testimony with us. Bernice, how are you today? I'm fine, how are you? I'm very blessed to have you. And, Thank you. And very blessed to meet you. This is God's design. Yes. Um, divine appointment, I would say. Exactly. <laughs> yes. uh, only the Lord can arrange things like that, yes. you know? And so that's why we always give him glory and honor. Mm -hmm. um, so, Bernice, you grew up in York, Pennsylvania, right? Yes. In the city. In the city. So how was your life in the city growing up without Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I say it was pretty hard. I mean, we didn't come from a, you know, rich family, you know, um, kind of poor area. I grew up in the projects, the East End projects of York City, um, you know, where a lot of mothers, you know, struggled, you know, to su support their children and put food on the table. So. It was a little bit of rough, but not, like I said, understanding, you know, we don't realize how not being connected to God, we miss so much. You know, we think I'm a good person. You know, I treated people good. I love people. So being a good person, I knew God wouldn't harm me. He wouldn't let nothing happen to me. I didn't realize that I needed to be saved until I was saved. <laughs> When we are away from Jesus, we think like we are good because um, the mistake we make is that we measure ourselves according to our good deeds, mm -hmm. our good works, and we think ourselves better than others because we yes. do more than others mm -hmm. probably. But the Word of God says that there's no righteous, no one, just God. And probably because of the lack of relationship with Jesus, and that's why, you know, unbelievers, people that don't know the Lord, make the mistake of thinking they're good. Mm -hmm. But it is like you said, Bernice, that there are good people in hell, in, in hell and that is a, mm -hmm. a sad reality. It is, it wow. Really is. But the Lord was trying to get your attention as you grew up, because you were reading the bible even though your heart was not totally given to jesus mm -hmm. right so so it, it's amazing to yeah. me just to know <laughs> that you had a longing and a desire to read the word of god and yet didn't understand you did not understand tell me about that yeah so um many years ago when i moved to south carolina um i ended up getting in a relationship that lasted like about five and a half years um, it was a very abusive relationship, very physically abusive relationship. And in those times, in between going through the physical abuse, I would find myself leading to the Bible. I would open the Bible because I kept feeling like there was something there for me, but I couldn't really comprehend what was there. So me trying to get to the Bible, read the Bible, I open up and I start reading it from Genesis, you know, not really understanding what I'm reading, you know. <laughs> here's the day and the night and all this stuff going on and it was just like oh, i shut the bible because i didn't really know but i call um i can think of a couple occasions where i had done that it was like it was a knowing inside of me if i get to this word if i find out who this god is that there will be some kind of freedom and some kind of peace and in my in my ordeal down there with the um the abuse um i began to lose hope I, I, I became a very depressive person. I had no um, blood family in this area. I didn't trust people. I didn't know who to trust because it was mostly his family there. So I endured this pain by myself. I couldn't reach my parents because we had no phones. You know, there wasn't cell phones like that back then. So I couldn't get to a place where I could call and call out for help. I just felt like I was in captivity. And that's what it felt and the abuse led me to a place where I pretty much was giving up hope on life. And as I uh, shared in my testimony, there was a moment where I had enough at this time. And, and during an argument, I remember grabbing a straight blazer, um, razor blade, sorry. And with the razor blade, I ran into the hallway and I remember trying to block um, my ex-boyfriend from grabbing it from me. And in that time, with all my pressure and, and my anger and my rage, and I was numb, 
I began to slice my wrist and I have the, the marks still. I seen a little bit of blood, but I couldn't understand at the time, but now I know how the, the razor never penetrated fully in my skin where it should have cut my veins, the, the anger, the pressure. When you're angry, you know, you get more power, you know, you're more stronger. So I couldn't think for the world. It did not dawn on me that it was just surface cuts. And I just, you know, end up stopping, you know, cause he was like really trying to grab it. But there was blood there, but it wasn't really pain. I was that numb, but I didn't realize, I thought I was gonna have to go to the hospital, wiped it off and it was just scratches. Wow. And I, oh I, I didn't I didn't understand God's hand was on my life back then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. yes. For his divine protection mm. over you. Over Hallelujah. Me. Oh my goodness. This did not is know. Did not wow. know. And then even um the abuse, you know, continued. Mm -hmm. So I got into a darker place. And it was like a year. Every day there was some kind of physical encounter for over a year. And at this time, I literally, I had enough. Wow. And I remember just giving up. I remember asking a friend, she didn't know, but you know, I wanted to go to the store and she drove me to a store and I was able to save enough couple dollars to buy a 50 um, pills of Tylenol. And I put it in the house and I said, Lord, if <laughs> this happens one more time, like it's over, you know, I was done, you know, with life, I, I just, it was no hope I felt, you know, I was in that desperate state. And once again, here's another day and the abuse started and luckily someone came and they knocked, you know, blew the horn. So he ran out to see who it, who it was. In the meantime, when he ran out, I had a grape soda and I popped the soda open. I grabbed the pills and I would pour the pills in my hand by the handful. And I would take the pills and I would drink the soda and until the bottle was going. So when he came back, he knew there was pills there, but he said, where's those pills? And I said, I took them, but it wasn't in a convincing way. I didn't want to convince him I took them because <laughs> oh, when you're Lord. done with life, you're done with life. Wow. I, I felt there was no way out, no way I could escape this. This was going to be my life wow. for the rest of my life. And I refused to live like that. So he ended up leaving with the friend. And so what I'd done, because a lot of times I always was baffled. Why do people commit suicide? What's so, uh, what's so, um, the, like painful in their lives that they want to give up their own life and a lot of times people commit suicide and they don't write letters they don't tell the people they don't explain my mother was in pennsylvania she had no idea fully what i was going through i couldn't share with her so i decided to sit on on the bed and write a letter to my mother and i just told her i loved her i uh, my niece and my nephew at the time who were who were really dear to my heart um i said tell you know tell Giovanna and tell junior you know, I love them and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be here to see them grow up, you know, just different things like that. And I folded the letter up and I had a pair of jeans on and I placed it in my um, left pocket. So after I sat there for a moment, I'd done something that I didn't realize what I'd done. I prayed wow. with this Tylenol in my body, 50 Tylenol, I said a prayer on the side of that bed. You, and I let the Lord know I was tired, what I was going through and I knew I thought at that time, this would be my last sleep. So I laid on the bed, you know, on my back and I positioned my hands over, you know, the front of me as if I was already in a casket because that's how I knew they would find me. And so I did, I, I, you know, I just pretty much was saying goodbye world and talked to God that I didn't really know, but I knew of, and I went to sleep thinking that would be my last sleep. Well, an hour later, I woke up and I was so nauseous, so sick that I really ran out my room, ran out the back door and I began to vomit. And it was like poison. I could just like taste this poison in the grape soda. And for three days after that, I couldn't eat a drink. So I realized when God had me share my testimony for the first time, it was an Easter Sunday at church where my family was there. Nobody knew, you know, about this happening down um, when I was in South Carolina, but God asked me to speak. Um, the church wanted me to speak on the Easter Sunday. And I was like, okay. But the Lord was revealing to me when in my testimony, it was three days. And I began to think about Jesus and his three days experience, wow. you know? So I was really fasting and didn't know I was fasting at the time. And it was three days without food and drink because I couldn't put anything to my mouth because of the nausea. And wow. it, I, I didn't want, 
it took like maybe 10 years it seems like before i could drink a grape soda because that reminder you know of that i could still and i still hesitate uh, that'd be the last soda i would pick you know would be a grape soda but in that i knew when that did not work i said something and i didn't realize what i was saying but i said god you must have something for my life I tried this twice and I failed. So I'm not really good at this. So I better not, I guess I just won't try it again because it's not working for me. So I never tried it again. Praise the Lord. Oh, God is so huge. He's so good and so merciful. He oh. has <laughs> his hands on you mm -hmm. because there was a predestined plan in your life that yes. was established before you were born. That's it. You heard a voice that told you, go back to North Carolina. Can you explain us that? Um, when I went back the second time? Okay, okay the yeah. second time. Because that's the first time I moved there. I, I stayed there for five and a half years. Okay. Upon um, me finding Jesus, okay. um, I, was, I was married at the time, and my ex-husband, he asked me to go to church with him because he made a promise to one of my aunts to come to church with them. So I was like, well, you made a promise thinking you should go, but I went with him. And when I walked into church that day, I never walked out. So I, and, and he pretty much walked out and never walked back in. So I was in that church maybe, I don't even know if it may have been two years. And I ended up having a fall and I was in um, the hospital bed for four months. I never gave up on God, you know, things got a little crazy, but the separation started with me and him. So long story short, we were separated at the time. The Lord spoke to me one night. I was in South Carolina visiting for the vacation um, holiday. And the Lord said, you're going to come back here. And I said, what? I said, you mean to tell me I'm coming back to South Carolina? So he said, yeah, go home before the holiday because next year, this time you'll be in South Carolina. I was like, it didn't make any sense. So I went home before the Christmas holiday came by that June, the Lord spoke, I need you to go to South Carolina for three years. I had no income, really. I didn't know how I was going to do this. And I said, Lord, okay, I hear you, but people are going to think I'm crazy. But <laughs> I didn't pay attention to what people said. I had to hear what God said. And within a month's time, I had already made plans. My one niece and her um, husband, they came over. I told them one day, I said, I'm moving back to South Carolina. And so they said, really? So they came, they left and they came back the next day and they said, are you really going to South Carolina? And I said, yes, I am going to South Carolina. So they said, well, we're going with you. So God paved the way where they got to go before me. I took them down before me. So then we ended up getting a place in a house and everything. I got into a church um, service and there was a prophetess there. And she said, I don't know what I'm hearing, but I'm hearing three years. So I said, wow, nobody knew that, you know, but one other person. And I, and I think like, yes, that is what God said. <laughs> Three years down there. And here in the church I was at, I end up becoming, uh, doing my initial sermon. Um, July will be eight years. So I did my initial sermon down there and became an evangelist. That is powerful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Yes. So we can understand that god speaks mm -hmm. that god god speaks he speaks in so many different ways so in god may be speaking right now to your life something that you did not expect to hear but when god speaks there is confirmation of his word you must obey also and that's what we are hearing from Bernice, she, I mean, the Lord spoke to her and she obeyed that voice of the Lord and the Lord brought confirmation and that, how, how awesome that was yes. to know that God was directing you and you were obedient to his calling. Yes. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. When did you become a pastor? Well, <laughs> that was I, almost three years ago, about three years ago. Um, I was in a ministry for five years and once again God started speaking through dreams and, and through people that it was time for me to branch out and I was confused because 
when I did my initial sermon in South Carolina and became an evangelist, there was a gentleman that was there at the initial sermon. And two weeks later, I met him at a gas pump while I was pumping my gas. And he spoke something to me that, that shocked me. And he said, did you open your church yet? Wow. Two weeks after my initial sermon, I looked at him. I said, I'm not sure what you're talking about. But me, I'm never going to be a pastor. I said, I'm not being the shepherd of nobody's sheep. I said, that's God's business. Oh, not. And he just God. looked at me and he said, you'll see. And he walked away. And I never knew what he was talking about. Wow. So when I came back, you know, to what I did, I did exactly three years in, in South Carolina, as he said. So in the three years, I came back and I was in a ministry for five years. I served. So then after I served in this ministry, it was time to branch out. And I went to another ministry um, to become an assistant pastor. And upon um, being an assistant pastor, they said, you'll be here like a year. I said, no, y'all better give me like three years. I need training, I, you know. So they, and so they came back and said, well, it's going to be a little shorter than a year. I said, you got to be kidding me. So it was exactly 11 months. Wow. 11 months I was assistant pastor. And on June 6th of 2020, um, I was um, ordained as a pastor. And on June 7th of 2020, that Sunday, is when we opened up the church in our home. For a Praise year, we were the there first. Lord. Hallelujah. Mm. And the name of the church is Bread of Life Tabernacle Community, Community church. church. Yes. Where is Bread of Life Tabernacle Community, Community Church located? Right now, um, we're using a building um, that belongs to Upper Room Last Day Ministries. And it's at 180 Big Rock Drive, Dover, Pennsylvania. Praise the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. So you're all invited to assist uh, that awesome congregation. Hallelujah. So how has your, your, your experience been as a pastor? Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big well, responsibility. Yes. I mean, I really had no clue um, what this was going to consist of. Um, the late hours, you know, which I've done them, but the tears, you know, I tell everybody I laugh, they laugh and my nephew can vouch. Um, when I look at my hair in the last two years, all this gray. <laughs> wow. So not to disencourage anybody, but early on in the ministry, even three months in, it was so heavy that I wanted to give up. Wow. I wanted to throw in the towel and then I seen why people were wanting to give up. But my nephew spoke to me and just said, it's only been three months and you want to give up? And I'm like, it hit me in my heart. So it kind of pushed me. And even though it's been trying times, it's been a lot of painful times, when you're doing the work of the Lord, if I serve and one comes to Christ and stays with Christ, then I feel like I've done all that I can do um, for this work. But I had to learn to just be content with whatever state I was in. I had to learn to endure. It just works on every you bit of your fruit, you know, learning long suffering, learning how to love people even more unconditional when people don't show up, when they're late, you know, coming to church, when it looks like some show up one week and then they don't. But you have to learn that the church belongs to God and the church really is in us, you know, to go out. So no matter what comes and no matter what goes, I had to I'll be determined that I got to do this work because God keeps saying it's more. It's more I have for you. But if I would have gave up, then where would the souls have went? Because my life I gave to Christ. So I don't own my life anymore. So I have no right to say what I can do with my life. But if I'm going through, I had to find God in the midnight hour. I had to cry out. I had to go through, what I, but it strengthened me. And when something don't break you with the enemy, he comes to break you down. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy whatever you want to do but god reminded me the second part of that verse he said but i came in john 10 10 that you may have life and life more abundant and a lot of times people think abundance means abundance of finances and things like that no but i need to have you to have abundance of joy yeah. abundance of love abundance of peace it's so abundance of mercy towards you know the fellow man and stuff so i had to learn a lot in these two years and i thank god i just say the gray hair is wisdom of god yeah. that he kept me and he he taught me and he's teaching me daily you know i have to surrender to him i have to trust him with every step i make you know we're we as pastors i'm sure we're not going to always make the best choices if we you know we, we can um have some mistakes and sometimes people don't give you room for mistakes when you're trying to grow but when your heart is postured in the right position towards god 
God's mercy will cover you and the love will cover you so you can continue to run on and be who God called you to be. Oh, praise the Lord. Wow. This is a powerful testimony. And I'm sure many lives will be touched and impacted by these words. Just treasure these words. The Lord is speaking to you right now. And when you humble yourself before the Lord and you open your heart before Him, there's nothing impossible that cannot be accomplished by His perfect will in your life. He can do it. Just give your heart to the Lord and He will act on your behalf. He will protect you. We hear this testimony from Bernice and, and we see how the Lord has protected her from the very beginning and the Lord put in her a desire for his word the Lord lead her to a congregation of believers to a church and she felt like she belonged there Amen. hallelujah yeah. <laughs> and the Lord gave her a position in ministry when she had never thought she would be a pastor of a congregation winning souls for the kingdom and directing a body for God's glory. This is huge. God can do more than what you can think, more than what you can even imagine. God can do so many great things in your life. So give God a chance. Open your heart to Him. Humble his, yourself before Him and call upon the name of the Lord and you will be delivered, safe, and prospered. So what would you say to them, to those who are hopeless and, and, right. and, and are in a state of they don't know what to do? They're hearing the voices and they can distinguish if that is the voice of the Lord. What can you tell them? I would say in anything that you're going through, even when it feels hopeless, um, one encounter with Jesus can change your entire life. It can just turn everything in a whole new direction. Um, God is looking to encounter people. He, he's looking to have that encounter. And it's about a cry out. You know, when you're crying out with a sincere heart, God is so faithful. He's going to come and see about his child because he calls us his children. But it's something when you become a, have a relationship with him, you really become his child. So one encounter can change your life forever. And it will take you on a road um, that you, 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 you're not going to want to look back. When I got on this road, as he said, when I went into that church, I felt like I was home. I can't even explain it. Um, there was something in me that I was drawn back the next week. And when I went back the next week, I already took somebody with me. And that person is still in my ministry. <laughs> wow. So I was already evangelizing, didn't even realize. I went <laughs> on to tell these people about Jesus because I tasted something that day. Wow. And I went sharing it. And by the next Sunday, I brought somebody else. And they're serving in the ministry. They're in the ministry with wow. me now. Four months later, another a lady who grew up in church, but she had strayed away. I talked to her and I said, I guarantee you, if you come, you won't go back to the world. And she came. She's actually a pastor today, too. That's huge. So we don't know the impact on our little testimony. It tastes and see that the Lord is good. When you have a taste, and I know I went out there and I was telling everybody about this Jesus. And to, I know they were tired of hearing me. But then God will taught me how to do it because sometimes we do it and not understand what we're doing in ignorance, you know, but you just want somebody to feel what you felt. But I just want to encourage the people today that um, you, you may even have a testimony. What you're even going through, God could turn that around one day. But when you say, you know, to the Lord, I trust you, show me your, that you're real. God does not have a problem showing anybody. He can speak in his word. He can speak in a dream. He can speak in the atmosphere we're sitting in with a bird. He can speak in any way he wants that you're going to know it's God. So just to encourage the people today, um, if you don't know God, if you have not um, had that relationship with Jesus, I encourage you to seek him. Because if you seek him, he's going to let, he's going to be found. He's not hiding, but he just wants you to look for him. He wants you to come to him because your burdens that you're carrying today, you don't have to carry like that. The things that feel heavy down, weighing you down, you feel lost for life where I felt like I was. If I would have succeeded, where I'm at today, people's lives could have been lost. Because what we do with our life, it alters other people's lives. So being a pastor or, you know, whether you're evangelist, whatever, we have a responsibility that we give up our life. 
and we follow his direction because our life is going to lead others to Christ. So you don't know your power. You might feel like you're nothing. You might not feel like God will never use you because you've been in so much stuff. God can use anybody. And I thank God because he's using me and I'm a living witness. That is powerful. Praise the Lord. Now I'm going to tell you this. Before we started this testimony time, we pray. Actually, Bernice make a powerful prayer. <laughs> and I will ask her to pray for you that are watching this testimony right now. Please do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was powerful. I felt the Holy Spirit so, such a, in a vivid way. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, Father God, right now, we Lord. just truly come to you thanking you, Lord God. Yes, Lord. Thank you even for this time that you allowed us to have in this beautiful atmosphere, oh God. Yes. God, I ask you to speak right now to the heart of somebody that's watching in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Lord. God, I ask you to touch their heart right now. I ask you to open their ears right now in the name of Jesus, oh God, that they can know that there's nothing too hard for God to do in the name of Jesus. That if you just trust him, if you obey him, if you come into the obedience of the will that he has for your life, that your life can be forever changed. I thank God for being the head of my life, but I know there's more for you. I know that this is not your end road. I know even if it's somebody that suicide has is, is been on your mind in the name of Jesus, God, we speak to that person right now in the name of Jesus, that you shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Because if the enemy is at you at that point and he is trying to get you away from the things of God, it's because you have purpose. So in the name of Jesus, I ask that God sees you, that you come into your purpose, that you come out of that hopeless situation. You come out of that struggle, even if it's an addiction that you're going through. Whatever it is, I'm telling you that God is the antidote to anything that you are dealing with in the name of Jesus. So right now, God, I ask you to bless them and keep them. I ask you to, to send your angels just to camp around them, Lord God, until they get to that place where they're pulling and pulling. So he said, the day you hear my voice, Harden not your heart. So when you feel the spirit moving upon you and you know that God wants to do something in the name of Jesus, yes. go with his spirit. And I guarantee you are in his arms and you are in a safe place and nobody can pluck you out of his arms in the name of Jesus. So God, we thank you for your people. We thank you for this time. We yes. thank you for even considering me to even do an interview, Lord God, that will bring glory to your name, Lord God. Not about me because it had not been for the Lord on my side. I don't know where I will be in the name of Jesus. So God, right now, we thank you for yes. everyone. Let them come across this video yes. that they may be passing by. Oh, and they may not even understand why they're going to stop at this video. But God, if they stop at this video, oh God, let their lives have an encounter in the name of Jesus yes. like never before. Let their mindset be turned oh, from evil to good in the name of Jesus. Yes. God, that you can deliver and set free just by your word yes. in the name of Jesus. So send your word out to your people in the name of Jesus yes. that they'll be touched in the name of Jesus. They'll be encouraged and their heads will be lifted up. And God, set the captives free in yes. the name of Jesus, oh God. We decree and declare it in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. The, the joy of the Lord is our yes. strength. Hallelujah. And we feel so much joy right now. Yes. Oh, the Lord is so alive. He is living and He is powerful. And He lives in us. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank Bernice, you, Lord. thank you for this word. Thank you for this testimony. Thank you for I'm sure me. so many are going to be blessed yes. by this testimony. Yes. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you.